leading us in a time of worship and praise. Thank you so much. Um, I'm mindful of uh, the Tapia family at this time. A dear member of our church, Crucita Tapia, went home to be with the Lord. Um, what day was that, Brother Greg? Thursday. Um, what a trooper Crucita was and what victory she now enjoys in his presence. And Brother Greg um, and Marty were so instrumental in just ministering to uh, Crucita on a regular basis. Greg, uh, thank you, brother, for your ministry. Uh, I know that there are others who join you in that, Jean and Judy and many others, uh, Gloria and others. But thank you all for uh, your ministry. Um, and Gloria just really stayed there with Crucita until all the things were wrapped up at the hospital. And I just, I, I thought, what a gesture, what a kind gesture to make sure that her body was taken care of. Uh, just thank you, Gloria, for your love and for your ministry. We also want to remember to pray for uh, our sister Marty, Marty Bishop. Her father passed away on Sunday, was it, or Monday? And uh, Marty had some time to spend with her father before the Lord took him home. And so we are mindful that we are uh, getting older as a congregation and uh, God is calling some of us home sooner than others. Had a great time at Season Saints yesterday talking about the sufficiency of Christ and death. Um, we'll be giving some more information to you all just about how to make sure that you have your house in order and your heart in order as we prepare for glory. I want to pray, and then after I've prayed, we'll look at the Word of God together. Father, thank you for uh, the reminders today in song of your mercy and goodness, of your promise to abide with us, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the sacrifice of our Lord who once and for all paid our debt in full and by his blood cleanses all who believe from sin. Lord, we thank you for the good news of the gospel and we pray that in this hour that your children would be built up in their most holy faith. We pray for those who are among us who are still outside of the kingdom. May your word cause them to have life and be brought into the kingdom of your dear son. And this is our prayer. We pray it together in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Would you take your Bible, please, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9. And if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand, and we have a couple of extras in the back. We'd love to get one to you. Perhaps you have an electronic device. Uh, if you would uh, go ahead and open up that Bible app and uh, locate Matthew, Matthew 9. Today... I'm going to go back to a previous verse that we looked at last week, verse 13, and I want to meditate together with you on verse 13. On Sunday evenings, I gather with a preaching team from the church. We talk about exposition. We talk about how to become better Bible expositors. And in that meeting with these men, uh, they gently rebuked me uh, and challenged me to take my time to not go too fast, that there are some passages that I need to unfold further. And it gave me the confidence to go back and think together with you about this important statement of Jesus. 
The message is entitled, The Dangers of Being Religious. Matthew 9, let's look at verse 13. Jesus said, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Did you know that being religious can be hazardous to your health? I'm speaking of your spiritual health. Now I know some of you hear me use that term religious and you say, well, pastor, you're not speaking to me because I don't have religion. I have a relationship with God. And I say amen. But I'm using this term religion in the old school sense. I'm using that term religion the way James used it. In James chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, James puts it this way. He uses this word religious this way. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is what? Worthless. Then he says in verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Are you a truly religious person? By religion, religious I mean you, know, you say prayers, you read your Bible, you come to church, you tithe on your income, you partake in communion, and you participate in fellowship. Would you consider yourself to be a religious person in the true sense? Yeah, I hope so. The word of this text is this, religious observation in and of itself is worthless in the sight of God if it is divorced from morality, if it is divorced from sincerity, if it is divorced from a sense of reality in your own life. And in the text, our Lord desires to teach us that religion without compassion is worthless. The Apostle John puts the question to us in a very pointed way when he said in 1 John 3, 17, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's one thing to say, I read the scriptures, I have a devotion, I participate in church, I tithe on my income. The question is, is your religion divorced from compassion? Helping people. John, the Apostle John, is asking in no uncertain terms, how can we claim to love God if we won't love our neighbor? How can we claim to be religious and not compassionate in our service to others, in our meeting the needs of those who are the outcast and marginalized of society? How can we say that our religion is true if we don't care about the lost? How can we say 
that our religion is true if in fact we don't think about the poor and how to help them. The God who we claim to worship is one who loves needy people. And so if we truly worship God, we will do the same. If we are not concerned for the people that God is concerned about, then our worship is phony. It's vain. Religion without compassion is worthless. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, Jesus brings us face to face with this subject. Listen to the words again. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus is quoting an Old Testament text here, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I'd like you to hold your finger in Matthew and find Hosea 6. What Jesus is doing is he is transposing this text from that day and time and bringing it into his day and time and applying it to a situation. In other words, what Jesus is doing here is he is taking the principle or the inner meaning of the scripture that had been revealed in one cultural situation and he is taking that and reapplying that principle into his day and time and applying it to the behavior of the Pharisees. You see, the culture and the context had changed. But the inner meaning of that text was exactly the same. And when we understand this text, in other words, when we understand what God means by what he says, we can reapply it a third time to our day and time. And what we're told in this text, in Hosea 6, is that mercy is more important than sacrifice. Compassion is more important than ritual. We are told in this text that people are more important than rules. Let's uh, think about the background and I think this text will come to light for us even greater. Who was Hosea? Some of you hear that term and you say, I don't have any clue on who this man is. Well, Hosea was a prophet. He was a prophet who lived in the northern state of Israel and he ministered in the second part of the 8th century B.C. His contemporaries were Isaiah and Micah. They ministered in the southern part of the kingdom. He ministered in the northern part. It was a time of a great national prosperity. There was a, an abundance of material wealth. There was great religious enthusiasm during that time. Sanctuaries were actually filled with pilgrims. There was um, capacity crowds at every shrine. The air was filled with with the incense and the smoke of sacrifices. The valleys actually reverberated with songs of praise. The Israelites were very religious during their time of economic prosperity. But at the same time, there was widespread moral and social corruption. Honesty was rare. Lies were common. People found it very difficult to trust one another. Uh, property and even life were unsafe for Many people as marauders roamed the countryside. 
The rich oppressed the poor. The judges perverted justice. They took bribes. Marriages were falling apart. They were being undermined by adultery. Families were being torn apart. We learn this by simply reading the books of Hosea and the book of Amos. This was the situation. This was the common corruption of the nation of Israel at that time. Now the question is this, what was at the heart of what was going on back then? Thank you for asking. You got Hosea? Hosea now turn to chapter four. Hosea chapter four, verses one through three. I'm trying to set the background so that you understand Jesus' words here in the New Testament. Hosea chapter four, let's begin in verse one. Hosea 4, verse 1, listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no what? No faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. You say, wait a minute, wait, what are you talking about? These people were very religious. You can be religious. You can be very religious and not know God. Verse 2, there is swearing, and deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Verse 3, therefore the land mourns. And everyone who lives in it languishes. Verse 6, Hosea 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of what? The lack of knowledge. Now, it is in that context, in that situation, that Hosea comes with a word from God. And part of that message was the words that Jesus quoted that is in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. Here is the verse that Jesus quoted in its entirety in Hosea 6, verse 6. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God than burnt offerings. Do you see it? Jesus quoted part of that verse in Matthew 9. Now let's be real clear as we try to unpack uh, the reason why Jesus quoted this verse. When Hosea first quoted it, Hosea was not saying that we shouldn't have sacrifice. He was not denying the sacrificial system. Nor was Hosea desiring that the sacrificial system be dismantled. He was not suggesting that the sacrificial system be discontinued. No, what Hosea wanted was that there would be no divorce between religion and compassion, that they be together. What Hosea was calling for was a marriage between sincerity and morality, that there would be a marriage between religiosity and social responsibility. If you'll notice here in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, the word loyalty is used rather than the word compassion. Um, Matthew translates the word loyalty, compassion, or mercy. And it's a word, that word loyalty actually refers to covenant love with God and toward others. And what Hosea was saying is that God prefers that quality of loyalty to him and to others 
above the observation of religious activities. He prefers the knowledge of the God of righteousness. That's God's preference. That's God's priority. Let me say it again so we can make sure that we're clear about it. Compassion is greater than sacrificial rituals. Love is greater than rules. Now Jesus quoted Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, on two separate occasions. One time he quoted it in Matthew chapter 12, verse 7, and here in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. And I want to show you something that you may overlook when you read those two verses. In Matthew 9, 13, and in Matthew 12, 7, there's a statement at the beginning of each of those. Uh, there is, uh, Jesus gives us a clue, a clue on what he was getting at. So turn with me again to Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. Matthew 9, verse 13. And I want you to know. I want you to notice at the beginning of verse 13 that Jesus says, Go and learn what this means. Then if you flip over to Matthew chapter 12, verse 7, you will see that he says, but if you had known what this means. In other words, Jesus was saying to the religious leaders of that day, you have read this verse time and time and time again, but you don't know what it means. If you had understood the inner meaning of the text, if you had just understood what God meant by what he said, then you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. This is what they did. They overlooked what the word of God said. Although they had read it and heard it time and time and time and time again. Now this is true of us in our day and time. Sometimes we come to church, we listen to podcasts, we listen to sermons, we listen to uh, Bible studies, and we don't take the time to really allow the truth to get deep down into us. We don't wrestle with it, we don't reflect on it, we don't say, Lord, what does, what does this really mean for me? What does this mean, period? How does it apply to my life? We can be like the people that Paul spoke of in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, when he said that there are people who hold to a form of godliness, but they deny its power. We can be religious and still be rebellious. In verse 7, Paul said of that same chapter, there are people who are always learning, but they're never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Does that describe you? Always learning, but you never come to that precise, experimental knowledge that actually changes your life. You're always gathering nuggets of truth here and there, but that truth does not change your life, and you never submit to it. How can we avoid such dangers? How can we learn compassion? I want to just turn over this text in Matthew chapter 9 verse 13 in a number of ways, but I want to ask four questions of the text. First, I want to ask, who 
was Jesus speaking to? Then I want to ask, what did he mean by what he said? Third, why? Why does God want us to learn compassion? Why does he desire it? And then last, how? How do we learn compassion? Are y'all with me? Is that simple enough as far as the outline is concerned? I know that it's been an extensive preamble, if you will, on the introduction. But this is where we're going to go in this text. Who, what, why, and how? And let's unpack this text a little bit further here, okay? Jesus said, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Who is Jesus speaking to? Well, if we let our eyes look back at the context, it becomes very clear who Jesus is talking to. He is speaking to those Pharisees. Notice in verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? Now, every time you hear the word Pharisee, remember what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said that there is a little Pharisee in every human heart. So don't just think about them. When you hear that term, think about yourself. The rabbis frequently quoted the first part of verse 13. Go and learn. They would say that to people who needed to get further instruction or to reflect further on the truth. And yet, they had not even applied the truth themselves. They were still missing what God was saying. And here's something that we need to hear and understand. Because they were ignorant of what God said, they found themselves actually contending with God in their ignorance. And this is a word for us today. If we don't understand what God means by what He says, we can find ourselves fighting against the purposes of God in ignorance. Do you want to learn from Jesus? If so, you must be willing to ask yourself, am I willing to obey what he reveals to me? Will I obey it? These Pharisees have become so obstinate, they have become so stiffened in their tradition that they were actually opposing the Son of God now, this can happen to us. Remember, it happened to Peter. That's right. You remember Jesus began to teach the disciples that he had to go to the cross, that he must be crucified. And Peter takes the Lord aside and begins to rebuke Jesus and say to Jesus, never shall this happen to you. And Jesus said, get Behind me, Satan. For Peter had not set his mind on God's interest, but man's. And so it's very easy for us, if we're not careful, to find ourselves opposing God's purposes in ignorance. Because we do not know the word. Because we do not understand what God means by what he says. These Pharisees were offended that relief had been given to a sinner. Can you imagine that? It's like, it's like saying to a sick person or, or to someone who gave a sick person medicine, why did you give them medicine? And being offended that you helped a sick person. They 
were opposing the very great physician himself in ignorance and later on it became clear in willfulness now Jesus could have just struck them dead right he could have just called 12 legions of angels and said take him out but he doesn't do that he sends them back to kindergarten he sends them back to school he says now go and learn what this means then he quotes Hosea 6 verse 6 I desire compassion and not sacrifice what does that mean what does Jesus mean by this I desire compassion and not sacrifice the plain meaning of the text is that God is saying I will have I wish I desire I delight in compassion and not sacrifice over and above sacrifice I desire mercy I do I do not want sacrifice without compassion I don't want attendance to church without adoration of me I don't want praise without compassion I don't want want participation without consecration I don't want ritual without righteousness I don't want duty without purity that's what he means I don't want your prayers without your heart I don't want your tithe without your life he said pastor you're pushing it a little bit write down these references and I'd like you to read them later Amos chapter 5 verses 21 and following John chapter 8 verses 31 through 37 John 8 31 through 37 Let's back up a step or two. And let's be clear that Jesus does not want sacrifice without mercy because an attribute of God Himself is compassion. Do you remember that? occasion where Moses asked to see the glory of God he said show me your glory and in Exodus chapter 33 verse 19 God said to him I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and compassionate on whom I will show compassion in Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 through 8 we discover that mercy or compassion is actually an attribute of God we read this in Exodus 34 6 through 8 then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord God compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness to thousands or four thousands who forgives iniquity transgression and sin 
yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And verse 8 says, And Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and what? Worship. When God revealed his very character, it was that of one who is compassionate. So what does it mean to be compassionate? To be compassionate describes a perfection of God. It, it springs from his goodness. And it denotes a ready inclination to relieve the misery of fallen creatures. That's what his compassion is. It is a ready inclination to relieve miserable creatures from their fallen and misery in their condition. The Bible says God's mercy is great, 1 Kings 3, 6. That his mercy is tender, Luke 1, 78. It's abundant, 1 Peter 1 and 3. And it's from everlasting to everlasting. Time would actually fail us to, to spend time unfolding each text that talks about the compassion of God. But when he said, go and learn what this means, he wants us to understand that it's a part of his very perfections, that he desires that his glory be shown not just in our worship of Him, but in our acts toward others. And not just ritual service. All right, let's move to the third question now. Why? Why is it that God desires that we learn compassion? I want to make it plain to you. Number one, because it, it bears the secret of his own life. It explains his mission. Jesus said, I came. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He came. And, and really that statement hints at the fact that he existed before he came. His incarnation was a voluntary act. He didn't have to come, but he came. Why did he come? He came in compassion. He came in mercy. He came on a mission, a rescue operation. Was he sent by the Father? Absolutely. But in his coming, he came to call us to repent. He came to call us to himself, to surrender. He calls us to eternal life. He places a high value on the importance of learning this lesson of compassion because you see, compassion reveals the very secret of his own life. The very secret of his own life. Now this is a lesson that we don't learn naturally. And so what Jesus is telling us here is that we must be diligent and intentional to learn about this. And I want to give you some practical reasons of why it's important to learn compassion. First of all, compassion serves as a thermometer of our own hearts. Yes, it serves as a thermometer of our own hearts. Ah, do you know how easy it is for us to get caught up in the outward appearance? Do you remember the answer that of, of Balaam to Balak, the king of Moab, who consulted him on this very matter? He was wanting to know what God required. And when, when Balak wanted to know what God required of his people, this was the counsel given to him. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. 
With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to Him with burnt offerings, with yearly calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Verse 8, He has told you, O man, what is good and what the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love what? Kindness and to walk humbly with your God. In other words, the very inner disposition of your heart and mind is what God looks at, not simply the outward act. So write this down. Wrong things, I'm sorry, right things done for wrong reasons are wrong in God's eyes. Let me say it again. Right things done for wrong reasons are wrong in God's eyes. People matter more than things. Love is more important than ritual. It is more important to make friends with sinners and risk your reputation than to avoid them and only appear to be holy. We must be careful that we don't make a judgment about our spiritual lives by simply our commitment to our duties. I go to church, I pay my tithes, I read the Bible every day, I say prayers every day, I stay out of trouble. If you really want a thermometer that will help you check the condition of your own heart, then ask yourself, is there a sense of compassion toward those who God cares about? Do I care about the lost, the poor, those who are oppressed? Do I care about the marginalized? Do I care? When our conduct is contrary to God's word, it is not pleasing to God. He said, Pastor, I didn't come to church to get beat up. I'm not trying to beat up on you, dear friends. I'm trying to warn you about the dangers of being religious. And so why is it so important that we learn compassion? Number one, it serves as a barometer of our hearts. Number two, it serves as a guide for our conduct. You say, what do you mean? Well, you see, there are practical situations that we're going to run into or encounter where there's a clash between our duty and mercy. For instance, perhaps you have a sick family member who needs your attendance, but yet you have an obligation, a duty to teach Bible study or to do something that is a legitimate duty. Which do you choose? According to the text, we should be clear that God desires mercy over sacrifice. Now let's be careful that we don't pretend that every little sniffle and scratch that a relative may get is a reason to bow out of our duties. We can deceive ourselves, but we can't trick God. He knows. He knows. Mercy, though, is a guide. It's a guide because it tells us that we ought to go where the need is. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus went where the need was. 
And if we are to emulate the character of God, if we are to emulate the very compassion of Christ, then we will run to need, not run away from need. The story is told about Hudson Taylor, who was the founder of the China Inland Mission. He went to church one Sunday in Brighton in June of 1865, and he was burdened, very burdened, for China. He looked around in the church, and he found the self-satisfied, hymn-singing congregation intolerable. He found them to be intolerable. He looked around him, and his biographer says that in pew after pew, all he saw was bearded merchants and shopkeepers and visitors and children scrubbed with bonnets and suits and trained to hide their impatience. The atmosphere was smug piety, and it sickened him. And this man picked up his hat and left church. He left. In his journal that night, Hudson wrote these words. I am unable to bear the sight of a congregation of a thousand or more Christian people rejoicing in their own security while millions perish because of a lack of knowledge. He wandered out on the sands of Brighton and in great spiritual agony, he prayed, Lord, would you raise up 24 skilled laborers to go to China? And we know God heard that prayer. Here was a man who had learned what Hosea meant. He learned what Jesus said. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Religion without compassion is worthless. Worthless. If we claim to worship God and we got no compassion, no social conscience for the poor and for the lost, then again, we are just like the Pharisees. Just like the Pharisees. So how do we learn compassion? How do we learn it? Number one, compassion is born in regeneration. We're on the last point now. How? How do we learn it? It is born in regeneration. When God gives you a new heart and a new start, according to Jeremiah chapter 32, God actually does something. He places the very fear of himself in you. This is how Jeremiah 32, 2, 38 reads, They shall be my people and I will be their God, verse 39, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, verse 40, and I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. Do you see it? Do you hear it? You don't, you don't learn compassion from just going to hang out with people who are miserable. Compassion is born in regeneration. And when God gives you a new heart, one of the first things you see is exactly what the publican saw when he went into the temple. He saw that he was a sinner in need of mercy. And he beat his chest and he said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Because he saw himself in light of God's 
great holiness. And God had mercy on that publican. And when God has mercy on you, then you begin to discover now you have mercy and compassion for others. So it's born in regeneration. God must give us a new heart. We're way too selfish in and of ourselves. We need God to show us that we deserve hell. We deserve condemnation. We deserve His judgment. And He gives us grace upon grace upon grace. How can we ever say, I don't want to have anything to do with those sinners when we have been sinners redeemed by His love? It's born in regeneration. Number two, it's cultivated in worship. It's cultivated in obedience. In Luke chapter 6, verse 36, after the great teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, it is clear that we are commanded, be merciful. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. Luke 6 and 36. We are called to be merciful just as our Father is merciful. They deserve judgment. They get mercy. We're to, we're to obey the Lord in this and as we do we are reflecting our Father it is expressed number three in the Great Commission there's no way in the world that we can say we understand compassion and we don't care about lost people and we must care enough about lost people to go where they are can I get a witness here we must be willing to go where they are. Or we're just like the Pharisees. Jesus went to the party, you remember? And I'm not saying to you that you need to go and hang out at parties. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that Jesus went because he went to share his love with those who needed it. And we must be willing to go. Where are you going? Where am I going? Who are we reaching out to? Last but not least, how do we learn compassion? It's born in regeneration. It's cultivated in worship and in obedience. It's expressed in the Great Commission. Number four, it's evaluated in the Great Commandment. And what is the Great Commandment? That we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we have to love others as we already love ourselves. You see, my compassion is not just geared toward helping those in misery. True compassion, first and foremost, expresses itself in a love for God. A love for God. And if that love for God is genuine and real, then it it flows out of our lives to the misery of others. And so, in closing, I love the way David expressed it in Psalm 51 when he said, You do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You're not you're not pleased with burnt offering. And then you remember that word to Samuel. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, Has the Lord 
as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. To obey is better than sacrifice. What is your religion worth? What is my religion worth? If all I do is come here on Sundays and sing and pray and read my Bible at home and give some tithes and offerings and then live my own life, what is it worth? I'm asking myself that question. I'm asking you to ask that question because at the end of the day, we need to examine our own hearts and recognize that the very reason for all of the sacrifices in the Old Testament, the very reason for them was that they all pointed to the mercy that God was going to show in Jesus. The very reasons for the sacrifice was mercy. God doesn't want us concentrating on the sacrifices. He wants us to concentrate on the mercy that he has shown to us in Christ. And out of that, to serve, to not ignore those in need. Whether they be poor or loss or on the outskirts of society, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, God will not despise. You may not be able to help every person in need. But if you feel their pain in your heart, you're closer to the kingdom than you know. Let's not be a church full of religious people who don't care. May God help us. Much repenting to do. Let us pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Well, the Lord has convicted my own heart of the lack of compassion that I have. And perhaps today he has shown you the lack of compassion of your own heart. He was willing to come into a world of misery and to deny himself he was willing to become poor that miserable sinners might become rich. He was willing to leave behind the glories of heaven and the prerogatives of his majesty in order that we might know the reality of his love. If we are going to display his compassion, we're going to have to be willing step out of our comfort zone uh, to sacrifice some things in order to be a vessel of mercy. We cannot do that without knowing His mercy first. If you find yourself today feeling so unworthy you're in good company. You're just like that publican who went to the temple and his soul was justified. 
He cried out. He repented of his sin. He cried out to God. God had mercy upon him. You'll be just like Zacchaeus. Salvation came to his house too because he recognized that he needed mercy. So today, if you see your need, then submit it to God. Submit it to Him. And then ask Him to help you to be obedient to Him by being merciful to others in need. Don't forget now, don't forget. He had mercy on you, and so you should have mercy on others. Perhaps you're here today and you don't think that there is a, there's a chance at all for you. Listen, that is the very reason Jesus came. For the no-hopers. And perhaps you sit here today smug, self-righteous, feeling no need to repent. May you heed the words of Jesus. Go and learn what this means. We thank you, Lord, for your word to us. We pray this in Jesus' name.